Thank you for joining us online. Uh, welcome. And for those in person, we're looking forward to an amazing study. Um, if you'd like to give those who are here and those online, give a warm welcome to Jennifer Johnson. Well, it's already been fun this morning, hasn't it? Um, I was looking around the room, and there are, I saw those hands go up for new people. And uh, there are a lot of familiar faces here, too, as well. And I was thinking, you know what would be really fun would be if we were able to go around this room this morning and have every one of you just stand up, tell us who you are, and then tell us a little bit about yourself. I just think that would be great fun. However, we're not going to be able to do that because there's too many of us in the room to do that. But I was thinking about that and I was reminded of a time that I was at an event where we did do exactly that. It's been a really long time ago, like 20 plus years ago that I'm thinking back to. Um, it was an event where, much smaller than this, where practically no one who was in attendance knew each other, so it was really awkward. As an icebreaker, then the hostess had us do what I just said I thought would be fun. And that is she had us each one stand, tell our name, and then tell a little bit about ourselves. And it really was very helpful. It kind of took out some of that awkwardness. Um, but like I said, that was like 20 plus years ago. And what most of us did was we'd stand, we'd say where we were from, if we were married or not. We talked about our children and our grandchildren. Some people talked about their hobbies, others about their careers, that kind of thing. Because back in those days, most of us were in that time of life, that season. I think we were probably mostly in our 40s and 50s at that time. So I'm giving myself away, but that was a long time ago <laughs> for me. 20 years ago, please don't do the math. Please don't do the math. I know you are. But anyway, so we're, you know, everybody's going around and we're telling, and it's a good thing, it's a helpful thing. But most of us kind of gave the same type of information until we came to this one lady. And at that particular time, she was a good bit older than the rest of us. She was probably like late 70s, early 80s. So she seemed older than we did at that time. But when she started to share, what she did was like everybody else, she gave her name. And then the next words that came out of her mouth were, I come from a broken home. And from that point on, she proceeded to tell us about how hurtful and how difficult her childhood was. And that's all she shared. She never told us if she ever married or if she had children. We, don't even, we didn't even know where she was from. She told us nothing except about that painful childhood. You could have heard a pin drop in that room. And I have to say, for my part, it broke my heart to hear her share that. And not just because it was a sad story, but because this lady who was in that season of her life was still stuck in that trauma. I thought, how sad is that, that when you get that far along in life and somebody says, well, tell me about yourself, and you go back to that season, and that's all you see. That's how you still identify yourself. And then later on, as I was driving home, I was still thinking about that lady, and it hit me that everybody else in that room had given information, but that one woman had given us more. She had given us insight. And I thought about that because in the Gospel of John, the Apostle John seeks to do that for us with Jesus. He wants to take us beyond just having information, not to discount the information, but he wants to take us beyond that and give us insight into who Jesus really is. You know, these 20 years later, that lady is the only one that I remember out of all those people that were there that day. I don't remember anybody else's faces. I don't remember their names. I don't remember anything they said. But I remember her because she gave us insight. And that's what John seeks to do in the Gospel of John. Now, um, let's see here, where am I going here? Um, in the very first chapter of John, John lays a foundation for us in order to give us this insight that he's seeking to share with us about Jesus. And he does that with these words, and they're gonna be familiar words to many of you. 
John says in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he continues on a little further, and he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So before he gives us any other insight into who Jesus is, he's laying this very solid foundation of letting us know that Jesus is not just the Son of God, but that Jesus is God the Son. Before he tells us anything else about Jesus, he wants us to understand that Jesus is God in the flesh. And then he begins to build from there on that foundation. And one of the ways he does that is by these seven statements, these seven statements that Jesus himself made about himself, each of which begin with the words, I am. Now, Catherine's already told you that this is a six-week study, that we're going to be looking at these seven statements. And in case you're doing the math, because I know you're mathematicians, you're already trying to figure out how old I am. But if you're concerned that we're going to do seven statements in six weeks, here's the deal. Two of those statements are in the same chapters, and so we'll cover the two of them in the same session. So not to worry, we're going to get to all of them. Now, every week in each lesson, we're going to have two divisions, and they're going to be exactly the same. That's going to make it easier for you, and it's going to make it easier for me. And here's what the two will be. Every week, the first uh, division of our lesson will be the setting. Division number one, the setting. We're going to be looking at the context in which Jesus made his I am statement in each lesson. And then the second one will be the statement. And we're going to look at what Jesus said and what, what that statement meant. Now, the very first I am that we're going to be looking at today is found in John chapter 6. So if you want to follow with me, this would be a really good time to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6. If it's easier for you to just listen, that's fine too. Sometimes it's harder to follow than it is to listen. So you do whatever works for you. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV, so if you have a different translation, it might throw you a little bit, and you may just prefer to listen. Now, <clears throat> I don't know how familiar you, you are with John chapter 6, but this is a really, really, really long chapter. There are 71 verses in this chapter. I hope you will be relieved to hear that we will not be covering all 71 <laughs> verses. However, if you're really, really familiar with John 6, you may also be disappointed as I go through that that means we're not going to be able to cover every single lesson in this chapter, and there are some treasures in here. But I'm confident that God will give to us the lessons he wants us to take home today. But I'm just giving you a heads up on that. All right, now, because we're starting in John chapter 6, that means that we're skipping five chapters. That's a lot of material. So before we jump into John chapter 6 with both feet, I'm going to really, really quickly just give you a little background of what's taken place before to put this chapter in its proper perspective. I think it will be helpful. So just bear with me and, and take note of these things. First of all, the events that take place in John chapter 6, time-wise, are about one year before the crucifixion. So that means that Jesus and his disciples have been ministering together at this point for two years out of the three-year ministry. When we come to John chapter 6, also, Jesus is at the peak of his popularity with the people. Everywhere he goes, everywhere he and his disciples go, throngs of people surround them. They cannot get away from the masses. He is at an all-time high popularity with the people. Many of them came to hear his teaching. Matthew tells us that, um, that Jesus taught with authority, that it was unlike anything they'd heard before. It was not like the teaching they were getting from their religious leaders. And so they were truly captivated by his teaching. So many came to hear his teaching on the kingdom of God. Then others came, and you can only imagine, for healing or maybe for themselves or for someone that they cared about. Everywhere Jesus went, he performed massive healings. So the people came for his teaching. They came for the healings. And then as in every kind of movement that's new, 
a lot of people just came out of bone curiosity. What's this new thing that's going on in Galilee? But everywhere they went, throngs, masses of people were there, and he was quite popular. When we come to John chapter six, popularity was peaking. On the flip side of that, his animosity, or the animosity, I should say, with the religious leaders was also nearing a point of peaking. The religious leaders did not like him, not one little bit. A matter of fact, in chapter five, the chapter right before John six, it tells us that they sought to kill him because, first of all, he had healed a man on the Sabbath, which broke their tradition. And secondly, he kept referring to God as his father, which they considered blasphemy because it was an implication that he was equal with God the Father. And they were furious with him, and so they sought to kill him. So the people loved him. The religious leaders at this point literally hated him. So he's got those two dynamics going on. But all that's kind of general information. There were two other very specific things that took place just before John chapter six. And the first of these is that John the Baptist had just very recently been beheaded by Herod. John was not only the forerunner for Jesus, he was a cousin. So this was a source of great grief, both for he and his disciples. So he's dealing with that loss. Another thing that's very specific is that um, his disciples, who Jesus had sent out on a mission trip throughout Galilee to teach and heal, had just returned. And although they were elated, they were just like we would do. They were just full of telling Jesus what had happened and what they had done. But at the same time, physically, they were exhausted. And so Jesus had said to them right before the events of John chapter six, come on guys, let you and I go away together and get some rest. So that brings us to John chapter six, which by the way, the setting is the feeding of the 5,000. Now I know many of you are familiar with this story, particularly if you grew up in Sunday school or if you've been in church or any kind of Bible study at any point in your life, you've probably heard this. Um, so, but this is the setting for the events that take place in John chapter six. You might be interested to know, and if you're looking for some new interesting fact to make a note of so you can bring it up in discussion, this might be one to some of you, that the feeding of the 5,000 and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are the only two stories that are recorded in all four of the Gospels, the only two, which should tell us how significant all four of the Gospel writers thought this particular event really was. Enough information, we're gonna go to the scripture. And I'm going to read to you, beginning in verse one through verse 15, the feeding of the 5,000. Verse one says, sometime after this, after what? after all that stuff I just told you, all that information I just gave you. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have just a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up saying, Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled baskets with 12, 12 baskets with the pieces of barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain 
by himself. I hope you were catching most of what I was reading. It's hard to listen sometimes just to have someone read to you. But let me bring it home to you by just high pointing, highlighting some of the points that we covered. The first thing that jumps off the pages to me is the irony of the, of the fact that he and his men were going away to get away. And yet, when they got there, the crowds had already, had already found out and met them. A matter of fact, Mark tells us that when the people heard where Jesus and his disciples were heading, that they literally ran around the lake. Jesus and his disciples are going over on boat, right? But the people ran around the lake on foot so that when they got there, the people were already like, surprise! They were already there waiting for them. But what I love is that both Matthew and Luke tell us that rather than being annoyed or frustrated with this change of events, that Jesus had compassion on the people. And he taught them and he healed them. What a great, what a great savior. Now, all four gospels tell us that as it began to, the day began to wane away and it got late in the day, that both Jesus and his disciples became concerned that these people needed something to eat. They'd been there a really long time and surely they were hungry. Now we noted, or I read to you, that he asked Philip, one of the disciples, where can we buy bread? The reason he asked Philip in particular is because there was a town nearby called Bethsaida and it was the hometown of Philip. So if anybody would know what was available for purchase for that kind of um, Need, what they were needing, it would be Philip. So he asked Philip, where can we buy bread for these people? Now, forget for just a moment the magnitude of buying that much bread. I couldn't help but think of a takeout order <laughs> like that with all these people. Because as we know, there were at least 5,000 men. But scholars tell us that it's more likely that the number was more like 10,000 to 15,000 because there would have been women and children there as well. So this was a huge crowd and it would have taken a massive amount of bread, which he pointed out when he said, eight months wages would not buy enough food for everybody to have a single bite. Now, eight months wages in that day was 200 denarii. A working person would make one denarii a day. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know a whole lot, and I don't relate at all to denarii. So I went online just for me, and hopefully it'll be helpful to you to kind of get a feel for how much money are we talking here in American money, or in money that we can understand. So I looked up what the average wage earner makes um, in our country today, and when I did the math, what it turned out to be was that the amount of money that we understand that would have been needed to feed all these people, to buy that much bread, would have been somewhere between $33,000, $34,000. That's a lot of money, is it not? Now, it's true that they, they traveled with a little money purse to take care of their expenses, and they often gave to the poor out of that money. But they did not have $30,000 worth of pocket change in that little purse. And that was the point that Philip was making. Philip's going, this is impossible. We can't do this. There's too many people and we don't have the money. It's impossible. That was the point that Philip was making. Now, I think I turned too many pages here. Nope. Um, Mark told us, if you, and I'm going to these other gospels because they all have the story and they're giving, they're giving us different details. Mark tells us that at this point, Jesus had also sent the disciples out among the people to see if there might be food that they would be willing to share. Maybe, here's another option, we don't have enough money to buy it. Maybe we can just pull whatever the people have and share it and it'll be enough. But we find in verse eight that that didn't work out either. Another of the disciples, Andrew, comes up and he says, well, we've got this little boy's lunch. There's five barley loaves and two fish, but how much is that for so many? And the point was well taken because the little barley loaves were not loaves of bread that we think of loaves of bread. They were like dinner rolls. So they would have been the circumference of a dinner roll. But it was worse than that because they would have been the thickness of like a slice of pita bread. So they had five little barley loaves and two little fish. Now we know because they were barley loaves that this little boy came from a poor family. 
because barley was the wheat, or the grain, not the wheat, it was the grain that the poor people used because wheat was too expensive, which means that those little fish were really little fish. It's more likely that they were salted or pickled like we would think of sardines. So what they've come up with from among the people is not much food. But I do love this part of the story. And you know who else loves this part of the story? Children love this part of the story. Because out of all those people, one little boy was willing to share what he had, and we're gonna see how God used it. So if you have a child in your life anywhere, be sure that sometime you tell them this story, because this little story speaks to little people. But Andrew's point really is the same point that Philip's making. We don't have enough. It's not going to be enough. In other words, along with Philip, he's saying, this is an impossible situation. We cannot meet this need. But you know what? They were wrong. They were wrong. You know why they were wrong? Because nothing that we face, along with nothing that they would ever face, is too difficult for Jesus. And he proves that in the miracle that follows. We're told that after the people were seated, Jesus took those loaves and he took those fish and he gave thanks. And then he had the disciples distribute them to the people and distribute them to the people and distribute them to the people until we're told that everybody there had plenty to eat, enough to eat. And not only did they have enough, but they had more than enough because they gathered up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. When we're facing a problem that's impossible, a situation that's impossible, Jesus is more than enough to meet that need. He gave them more than enough. But I want to go back to verse 6 for just a moment because Jesus knew all along that he was going to do this. But when he spoke to Philip, he, he made it sound like this is a serious thing here. What, we're gotta, where are we going to buy bread for these people? But we're told that he asked him that in order to test him. But it wasn't a pass-fail test. It was a teaching test. You know, there are times in our lives, too, when Jesus will test us. And in our lives, it's not going to be a pass-fail either. Can you make this happen or can you not make this happen? Will you do this? Will you not do this? It's a teaching method that Jesus uses. He wanted Philip to see that nothing was impossible with him and that nothing was impossible for Philip either if Jesus was allowed to work through him. So it was testing. He wanted him to understand who he was. I was thinking back on this as I read this story to um, an event that took place in a friend's life several years ago um, because it seemed to me to so relate to their situation. She was, um, she was sharing with me that there was a time in her marriage when she and her husband were really going through a time of some serious financial strain. She said literally every penny mattered. She said they would even do sometimes envelopes and go, this is grocery money, this is phone bill money, this is gas money. It was that tight for them. And it didn't help that they had children in college at that time either. And she said during one of these tight weeks, they got a bill from one of the kids' schools and it was saying that their tuition was due for the next semester and it was due by a certain date. So her husband picked up the bill, wrote a check, and sent it. And they had enough to cover it. They did. That part was okay. What was not okay is that when they sent that check, it pretty much wiped out their bank account. And on top of that, they were pretty much out of food as well. So we were down to almost nothing. And on top of that, their pay, their next series of pay was like a week and a half away. She said it was just absolutely financially the perfect storm. And she said, I could feel panic rising. But she said, instead of giving way to it, we prayed. And she said, because I had to move on. For one thing, she had some friends coming over for church for a potluck dinner. And she said, I did have, I had already made up my casserole. She said, so at least I had that. And she said, so I put on my happy face and we had our guest. And she said, but that night something happened that had never happened before. 
every single person that attended that dinner brought way too much food with them. And not a single person who had brought extra food took it home with them, even though they didn't know their situation. And so they were able to eat off of the food that was left by their friends until their next paycheck came in. Jesus met their need in their hour of need. I want to ask you if you think, was Jesus testing my friend in that? She thinks that he was, but she's not upset about it because that test taught her that Jesus really is, not just because she's been taught it, but she knows by experience, her provider. You know, one of the names of God is Jehovah Jireh, which means God is my provider. She will never forget that experience because she learned it through the test that Jesus allowed to come her way. There are likely some of you in this room today who are in a difficult situation because life's hard. I know it's hard. I hear the stories and you do too. We have friends, we have neighbors, we have family and we know life is hard. Some of you may be in a difficult situation today and you're thinking, this is impossible. There's not an answer here. And maybe for you, there isn't. But nothing is too hard for Jesus. And please, if you can, consider the fact that he may be allowing this in your life to test you, to teach you more about who he is. It may be that you're just like my friend and you need to know that even though it looks like, well, I guess we won't be eating till you know, next month or something, that that's not the case. That's not the case. Jesus may want to teach you that he also is your Jehovah Jireh, your provider. There's a lot of new faces in here today, which I think is wonderful. But it did occur to me that some of you may not just be new to this Bible study, you may be new to this community. And you don't really have a lot of friends here because you're new to this community. You know what? I've been in seasons like that before, and you know what I learned there? And maybe Jesus would want to teach you about that season, that testing time, allowing that loneliness. Maybe it's this, that Jesus himself is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You know what I learned in the season of my life when we were living somewhere I didn't know anybody else? Jesus can be your very best friend if you'll let him. But sometimes he allows these difficulties to test us, not pass fail, but to teach us about who he is and what he can do for us. Now this miracle seems to be one more act of compassion towards the people. He taught them, he healed them, and now he's fed them. And it was to a point, but it was much more than an act of compassion. Jesus also intended this to be an act of revelation, or at least illumination to these people about who he really was, because there was a lot of confusion. Honestly, even the disciples were not 100% clear on all the ins and outs of who Jesus was. And so it was not just an act of compassion, it was also meant to be an act of revelation. Now going back just a moment to verses 14 and 15, I'm gonna reread these. After the people saw that sign, that miraculous feeding, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. See, Moses had predicted that someday a leader, someday in the future from those people that he wandered with in the wilderness, someday in the future, another person, another great leader would come who he referred to as that prophet. And the people are going, look what this guy just did. I bet you he's that, he's that leader that Moses was talking about. And so it tells us that coming to that assumption, they decided they would take him by force to make him their king. Because just as Moses had set the people of Egypt free from the bondage of Egypt, they were hoping for a leader that would set them free from the bondage of Rome. But Jesus, knowing their hearts, stole away from them rather than letting a mob scene take place because that would have caused a lot of problems with the Roman government that they wanted to be freed from. Now, in verses 16 through 24, we have the account of Jesus sending his disciples back across the lake and then later joining them. 
This is one of those sections of scripture we're not gonna look at this morning, but I do highly encourage you to read the story because it's one of the best that you're gonna find anywhere in the scripture, but we don't have time to go there today, so, <clears throat> so we're not going there. All right, we're gonna move on then to our second division. This is what, that was the setting. We're moving now to the statement. What did Jesus say? This is where we're going to find the first of the seven I am statements. Now this particular statement was made the next day in the town of Capernaum, which is back across the lake now. Jesus and his disciples are, have left the hillside where the miracle took place, and they're now back in Capernaum on the other side of the lake because this is where Jesus primarily headquartered during his earthly ministry. Well, of course, when the people realized they were gone, what did they do? What they always did, they followed. So they found Jesus in Capernaum, and this is where we pick up in our second division, beginning in verse 25. It says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, verily, truly, I say to you, you're not looking for me because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. They followed him, all right, but they were following him for the wrong reason. Jesus is pointing out to these people that they were far more interested in what he could do for them than who he could be to them. And you know what? There are sadly a lot of people in the world still like that today. There are a number of people who sit in churches, who go to Bible studies for no other reason than for what they believe Jesus can do for them. They're not so much interested in who he is or, for goodness sakes, what they might do for Jesus, but in what Jesus can do for them. And that was exactly the situation with this throng once they'd been fed. Jesus realized that their problem is, <coughs> excuse me, is that their perspective is wrong. Their whole perspective of life is wrong. And so in the, the things he says that follow, he's, he's attempting to change their perspective. They're looking, they're looking and they're thinking physical when they should be looking and thinking spiritual. So beginning in verse 27, he then begins to try to give them a different point of view. He says to them, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. <coughs> Sorry, girls. For on him, God the Father has placed a seal of approval. They have an, a, a genuine need for food, and so do we. There are physical things, material things that we need to have in this life. But Jesus is trying to show them that their, their physical need is superseded by a greater need, <clears throat> which is a spiritual need for spiritual food. And so he redirects their thinking, or at least attempts to. Now, <clears throat> sorry, I want to read to you verses beginning in um, verse 27. Well, we just read that. No, verse 27 through 30. He says, Jesus says to them, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, <coughs> which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Now, talk about a shocking bit of information. This, this is not what they expected to hear, and I'm guessing not what they wanted to hear. Because the Jews at that point in time were very work-oriented. Their whole mindset was that you pleased God, that you were in relationship with God by doing things according to the law of God. And so they're looking for another law or another regulation that they can follow in order to do the works of God. And Jesus said, there's only one work that God requires of you, and that's to believe in the one he has sent, who of course was Jesus himself. And you know what? This is still a stumbling block for people today. My daughter has a friend that she's been trying to share with for a really long time, and this is where they get stuck, and this is where their conversation seems to just falter, because her friend cannot wrap her mind around the idea that she doesn't have to do something to earn God's approval, that she doesn't have to do something to earn salvation. And that's where the Jews were coming from. Yeah, but what do you want us to do? And Jesus said, here's what God wants you to do. 
He wants you to believe. That's the requirement. Um, he says, so they asked him then, what sign then would you give us so that we may see it and do it and believe you? What will you do? So, okay, you're saying that all we have to do is believe in you. Well, prove to us then that you're worthy of our faith. What will you do to prove to us that you deserve our faith, our allegiance? And the, the irony here is that just the day before, they'd wanted to make him king. Just the day before, he had spent hours teaching them, healing their sick, and then of course there was that miraculous feeding. And these people have what I consider the great audacity to say to him, okay, that was all good, but what else have you got? And here's what they're looking for, really. They're wanting him to prove that he is, is as worthy of their allegiance as Moses was of their forefathers' allegiance. And we know that because in verse 31 they say, well, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. In other words, can you do as good as Moses did? Now, the first error was that Moses did not give them that food, God did. That was the first place they were off track. But what they were really saying to Jesus is like, what you did, that was impressive. That, you know, kudos to you. You fed thousands of people. But that was in a single afternoon. Moses, on the other hand, fed millions of people in the wilderness for 40 years. Can you measure up to that? If you can, if you can prove you're as good as Moses, then maybe we'll believe in you. Jesus responds to their challenge in verse 32. First of all, he says, I tell you, it is not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And here it is, ladies. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You want bread? You want real bread? I am the bread of life. Their response, again, is a little arrogant and a little off-putting. In verse 41, they, we read, at this the Jews began to crumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say that I came down from heaven? Clearly, they did not have the backstory of the virgin birth. They were assuming, wait a minute, this is a guy we've known all our lives. We know who his parents are. Where is he coming from telling us that he came down from heaven? You, some of you in this room know that sometimes the people that know you best are the most difficult to share the truth with. And they're thinking kind of like these people were to a point, who are you to tell me? I know you. I watched you grow up. I saw you knock your brother's bike over, whatever. I know you. How do you, how dare you, they're saying to Jesus, claim that you came down from heaven. We know where you came from. We know your parents. Now, Jesus literally responds to their grumbling in two ways. And the first way he responds is by repeating the claim. I am the bread of life, he tells them again. And then the second way he responds is by contrasting himself with the manna that they were so impressed with. In verse, let me find it, 47, he says, Verily, verily, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here's the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. Again, he tells them, I am the bread of life. And then he, that, in the contrast, he's saying, okay, here we go, guys. Manna came down from heaven. I came down from heaven. Manna gave life. I give life. But here's the rub. The people that ate the manna, because it was temporary and physical, died. But the bread that I give leads to life that's eternal. It's a spirit life, and those who eat this bread will never die. 
Do you know that, what that does for the bread of life? It makes it the winner. The bread of life is superior to the manna that they were so impressed with and thought he needed to live up to, to prove his worthiness. But how is this manna received? Well, Jesus has told us now three times how, um, how his manna is received. The manna in the wilderness was received as the people went and picked it off the ground. If you've read the story, it was like little crackers, little thin wafers, and it appeared every morning. So they just collected it in buckets or whatever, baskets, whatever they had. But the manna or the bread that Jesus gives is received by faith. In verse 29, remember, they said, what's the work we need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, you believe in the one that God sent. That's the work. You believe. In verse 40, we've read, when he said, whoever looks to the Son and believes shall have eternal life. And now in verse 47, he says, he who believes has eternal life. So if you believe to get eternal life, how do you eat that bread that leads to eternal life? by believing, by receiving it, by taking it in. That's how you believe it. That's how you receive it. I was thinking back to John chapter 3 when Jesus had a conversation with Nicodemus. Some of you are probably familiar with that, um, that event as well. Uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus in three John 3.16, you know that verse, you see it with people in their banners and sometimes on the ball fields or in their stadiums. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, what? Believeth in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. So how do you get everlasting life? You believe. And how do you eat the bread that leads to eternal life? You believe. You believe. It's all by faith you believe. But moving from Nicodemus to this crowd... Jesus went a bit further in his explanation, which I found to be quite interesting. Again, he says in verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And here's here's the new information that he did not share with Nicodemus in terms I think Nicodemus would have understood. He says, this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. I am the bread and I will give myself this bread for the life of the world. He was telling them that he was going to die, that he was going to lay down his life so that the world might have life, that that was his way of providing the bread that they would eat. And then in verse 53, he says, I tell you that unless you eat the flesh, in other words, eat this bread of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Now, the people's response to this was threefold, and most of it was negative. Um, I just want to pause here for a moment and say that this can be a controversial passage. So keep that in mind as I tell you how the people responded and as we move a little forward. The people's response was threefold. And as I said, all three of their responses were negative. The first response was that of confusion. They say to one another in verse 52, let me find my verse 52, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus has said, unless you eat my flesh, you have no life. And they're going, what? How can we eat this man's flesh? What is he talking about? But the reason it was so confusing to them is because they were not understanding it as a metaphor, but as literal. It's the same thing that happened with Nicodemus. If you know that story, what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? If you're to see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And Nicodemus had pretty much the same reaction they did. What? How can a man who is old enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus is saying, That's not what it means, and that's not what it meant here to literally eat his flesh. But like Nicodemus, they were confused, and understandably, because they were taking it, as Nicodemus initially did, as a literal eating of flesh and a literal drinking of blood. Now, here's one I want to just mention for a moment, and I do not mean this in any way to be critical, so hear me out, okay? There are some in Christendom today who still take these verses literally, 
and they equate them to what we refer to as the Lord's Supper or to communion or to the Eucharist. And they believe that the elements of the Eucharist, the wafers or the bread, literally become the body of the Lord Jesus and that the wine or whatever element they're taking literally becomes the blood of Christ. So like these people who were so confused about how this was even possible, there are some in Christendom who, who see it in the same way. They really are relating it to the Last Supper when Jesus handed out the bread saying, this is my body, and the wine when he says, and this is my blood. But without being critical, let me tell you why I disagree with that understanding that, that the people who hold to this today have. First of all, the Lord's Supper was not instituted until almost a year later. If it had been critical to salvation, if it had been critical to the teaching he was giving them right then and there, why did he not then institute it at that Passover? We were told in verse four, the Passover feast was near. It would have connected a lot more smoothly, wouldn't it? If he'd just done it right then and there, they would have understood it better if he'd made it clear if that was his intention. But it wasn't until a year later until the Lord's Supper actually took place. Also, both Luke and the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, both of these tell us that Jesus gave this um, observation to the people, to his disciples and to generations to follow as a memorial, as a reminder of what he had done to purchase our salvation. Nowhere, nowhere in any of those accounts does he present it as a prerequisite or a requirement for salvation? So for those reasons, I believe that today's literal eating of the flesh and blood is a misunderstanding. That's my position. I base it on scripture. And again, I'm not saying it to be critical, but because I believe it's true. And even when teachings are hard sometimes, I have to tell you what I believe is true because I would be accountable to God if I did otherwise. And you know what? I wouldn't want to teach you error anyway. Why would I do that? All right. So their first reaction was that of confusion. How can we, how can we eat his flesh? How can we drink his blood? The second was re reaction was one of offense. And we see this beginning in verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Now, when you go back to the original language, this is a hard teaching they mean this is a, an offensive teaching, not difficult to understand teaching. This is an offensive teaching. Who can accept it? So they were offended with him. Now they were already offended with him because he said he came down from heaven. And now they're doubly offended with him because he said, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood or you don't have eternal life. And that's why he says though, when he sees that they're grumbling about this, he says to them in verse 61, does this offend you? then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? You're so put off because I'm saying to you, I came from heaven, I'm the bread that God sent from heaven. Well, what if you see me returning to heaven from where I came? You know why he said that? Because he knew a time was coming when he would indeed return to heaven, following the resurrection at the time of his ascension. What about then? You believe I came from heaven when you see me return to heaven? It's basically what he's saying to them. But they were also offended by this business of eating the flesh and drinking the blood because as good Jews, they knew that the Old Testament soundly and solidly condemned both practices. They were forbidden in the law to drink blood. A matter of fact, even animal blood. They were required to drain the blood out of an animal before they cooked it to eat it. You, the life is in the blood. God says you shall not drink blood the blood, you shall not eat the blood. So you can imagine if this is what you've been taught for generation, for generation, for generation, that that would be offensive to you when this man you think is gonna be your great leader says, you need to drink my blood in order to have eternal life. They were very put off by that, along with the eating of the flesh. The only time the Old Testament even mentions eating of flesh is as a curse. When God pronounces through the prophets sometimes that he's gonna judge Israel and he wants to make a point with them on just how bad this is gonna be and how disgusting this is gonna be, he tells them that it'll be so awful for you in that day if you don't repent and I send judgment that you will be eating your own sons and daughters. That's how despicable the very idea was to them. 
So understand, they took offense at that also. So they're confused and they're offending, they're offended. But Jesus knows that some of them are taking it literally and that that's part of the confusion and part of the offense. And so he seeks to clarify their misunderstanding of it in verse 63. He says, the spirit gives life. The flesh, the flesh, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. Again, it reminds me of the conversation with Nicodemus. When Nicodemus was all confused about how a person could have a second physical birth, Jesus said to Nicodemus, no, Nicodemus here, the flesh gives birth to flesh. The spirit gives birth to spirit. They're two different things. He's speaking in metaphors. Nicodemus was confused by it, and these people were confused by it. And so Jesus seeks to clarify it by telling them, that the flesh counts for nothing. The words that he speaks are spirit. Now, as we come near the end, I wanna just recap for you three things that you could use as a takeaway from this lesson. It may not be the takeaway that you're gonna take home to keep forever, maybe it will be, but just for clarity. Because this is not an easy passage to understand. And I have to tell you, and you're probably guessing, I had to literally cherry pick the verses to share with you. Because if you just read this straight through, I think there are some of us here today whose heads would also be spinning. It would also be confused and maybe also be offended without the right understanding. So let me just kind of capsule for you the takeaway points in this lesson. The first one is Jesus is the bread of life who provides eternal life. You know why I think Jesus chose bread as his illustration of who he is? You know, for you and I, bread is like optional. A matter of fact, in my case, I I love bread, but I often avoid it because it's fattening, (laughs) right, vanity. But in their day, bread was a staple of life. If you didn't have bread, you didn't live. You had to have bread or you would die. And Jesus wants them to understand that spiritually, he is the bread that secures their life. Without him, you will die spiritually. So that's point number one. Point number two is the means provided by sacrificing his life as a payment for sin was what he meant when he says, I give my flesh for you. This is this, I am the bread and I give, I, I give my flesh for you as payment for your sins. And we acknowledge this as we commemorate that sacrifice in the Lord's Supper. And then the third thing is that it's through faith that we eat the blood and drink, drink the blood and eat the flesh. It's through believing that we receive the Lord Jesus, that we receive the living bread. In verse 47, I read to you again, he said, truly, truly, the one who believes has eternal life. So the people were confused, they were offended, but there was one more reaction. And to me, honestly, this is the saddest of all. It says, from that time, and here's where the tide starts to turn, ladies. From that time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Things are beginning to change. And this is a really bittersweet passage that follows, verses that follow. He turns to the twelve. Remember, there's thousands of people throwing me around him, and I'm supposing that the majority walked away. So he turns to his inner circle of 12, and he says to them, you don't want to leave too, do you? And in verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Do you know what happened at that moment? All those people who had witnessed the miracles, had heard the teaching, had seen the the 5,000, the 10,000, the 15,000 receive that miracle dinner, were now at a crossroads. Jesus has told them that the only way to eternal life really was to believe on him. They were confused, they were offended, 
And even if they had understood that he was saying, I am your only way to eternal life, I think that many of their reactions would have been just the same. People today are offended by that. There can't just be the one way. And so many of them walked away. But there was a crossroads there for everybody that heard his message. You will either go with Jesus or you will turn and walk away from Jesus. And you know, everybody today in this generation who hears the gospel message of Jesus, that it's through his death on the cross that our sins are paid for. And it's through our believing and accepting that sacrifice that we have eternal life. That's the gospel. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again to save us from our sins. When people hear that message today, they too are at a crossroads. And they will either accept it, no matter how unpopular it may be, no matter how difficult even sometimes to understand it may be, or they'll just walk away. It's just they turned their backs from him. They turned away and they turned back. You know what they turned back to? They turned back to Judaism. They went right back to works. It was something they knew. It was something they could do. It was a standing with God they felt like they could earn. This was just too extreme for them. Um, When we come to that crossroads, we have to choose. We each of us choose this for ourselves. I heard uh, Ann uh, Graham Lott say one time, Jesus is a gentleman. He never forces himself on us. He allows us to choose. And I think that there's a principle here and that and the principle is this. Jesus does not force us to believe, but he does invite us to believe. He doesn't force us, but he invites us. And there are a lot of you I know here today and there are a lot of you I don't know. So I'm just gonna throw this out to everybody. Is it possible that Jesus is inviting you to believe today? Maybe this is your crossroads moment. You've never heard it with understanding before, but you understand it now. Is Jesus inviting you to believe and in believing to eat that flesh and drink that blood that secures your eternal life forever? In just a moment, we're gonna break and we're gonna have discussion time and I know that you all will be good at that because I've already heard you sharing earlier. But before we do that, I'm just gonna ask you to bow with me for a moment and I'm gonna pray out loud a prayer that you might pray in your heart if you are the person I've been speaking about. If Jesus is extending that invitation to you today, don't let the moment pass. Everybody that's in Christ said yes at that moment. I still remember the moment I said yes. So bow with me if you will, and let's give those who might want to receive that opportunity the chance to do so. Pray something like this, or put it in your own words in your heart, whatever, however God leads you. Father, I have learned today that the way to eternal life is not through works. I have learned today that the way to eternal life is to believe in you as the living bread, the bread that was broken and the blood that was spilled out on that cross to pay for my sins. And I'm asking you today, Lord Jesus, to save me. I'm asking you to accept my newfound belief that this is the truth, to come into my heart and life and be both Lord and Savior. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that was the a day for somebody, and if it was and you have questions, then ask the friend who brought you or I would be happy to talk to you. But if you prayed that prayer, you now have eternal life, and guess what else? You are now a member of the family of God, so welcome aboard. All right, I'm going to now dismiss you, or not dismiss you, don't go anywhere, I'm not dismissing you. I'm gonna dismiss myself. I'm gonna step aside for a moment and turn this time over to you for discussion, and when that discussion time is over, I'll try my best to get your attention again, and I have some closing thoughts to share with you, so go for it, girls. If you're new to me, then you don't know, but you probably already figured out today, I'm big on information. There's so much stuff I'd like to tell you guys, and this lesson we did this morning, I was cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. (laughs) 
If you bring a sleeping bag next week, we'll be, we'll be better. We'll be better. We'll just stay and we'll cover it all. But one of the things I think is really important that you understand is what I'm going to share with you now. So if you can, hang with me just for a few more minutes. But there wasn't time to fit it in that lesson, even though I chopped everywhere I could see to chop. What I want to share with you is that when, in these I am statements that John gives us that Jesus made about himself, that every time he uses the word I am to identify himself, those two words all by themselves are very, very profound. And so what I wanna share with you as we wrap up this morning is what makes those two words so special, what's so important about the words I am. And so I'm gonna share with you three quickly, as best I can, uh, let me get my Bible back out here, three passages of scripture that I think are gonna give you, a, hopefully give you a new appreciation for those two words that and maybe you didn't have before. The first one is from the Old Testament, and you don't need to turn there because I'm just going to read a couple of things as I go through um, in Exodus chapter 3, but I do want you to know where I'm reading from. So I'm going to begin uh, in Exodus chapter 3. This is when Moses is living in the Midian Desert. He's been there now for 40 years. He fled Egypt because word was out he had killed uh, Hebrews, um, one of the taskmasters who had, was beating a Hebrew slave. So he ran for his life, and he settled in Midian, and he lived there for 40 years. He married, he had children, and when we come to Exodus chapter 3, he's now working as a shepherd for his father-in-law Jethro. So I'm going to pick up in three, beginning in, this is a new Bible I have too, which is making me crazy. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to my old one. It's just falling apart. Anyway, Exodus chapter three, I digress. Beginning in verse one, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. In verse nine, now the cry of the Israelites, God says, has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Verse 13, God, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And this is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. In the literal language, that I am actually means the eternal, self-existent one. God identifies himself by name to Moses as I am. That makes it significant. The second passage takes us to the New Testament and it actually brings us back to John. This time, John chapter eight. Um, Jesus has been teaching the people here, as we see so often, and as we often also see, he's being challenged by the religious leaders. And in John chapter 8, beginning verse 51, he's been telling the people to believe in him, and the religious leaders, of course, are not having it. Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. In verse 53, the religious leaders say, whoa, are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Verse 58, Jesus tells them, Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, Before Abraham was born, I am. Verse 59, At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Do you know why they picked up stones to stone him? because he claimed to be God and they understood it. It was blasphemy and the penalty for, for blasphemy was death by stoning. So Jesus identifies himself in John chapter eight as I am. The last one then is found in, um, let's see here, John chapter 18. Now this is the, set, the setting for this one is the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is about to be arrested. And John 18, I'm gonna read verses one through th three, when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples, this is after the Last Supper, and crossed the Kidron Valley. 
On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Okay, so what we have here in this scene is Jesus and his disciples in the garden. They've been praying, and here comes Judas with a small army, basically. It says that the temple guards are there. It would have been their responsibility because they were the Jewish guards of the temple sent by the Jewish religious leaders. This was a Jewish matter to arrest Jesus. That would have been their responsibility. But a group of temple guards sent on a mission would have been in the numbers of about 200. So you've already got a lot of guys right there. But for additional security, they also had a Roman detachment with them. They were maybe expecting a riot if they tried to take him. Remember, up to a certain point, everywhere he went, there were thousands of people. So they were armed and ready for anything. A Roman detachment numbers anywhere from three to 600. So let's just go with a small number and say there were three. That gives you approximately 500 men coming to arrest Jesus. Um, I think it's Matthew, and, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all describe this as a great multitude who came to arrest Jesus. They're ready, they're ready to take him, and they're armed. And these are, these are the elite guys, y'all. These are the, the best of the best. These are well-trained, brave men who are ready for a riot. They're ready for anything. It's important that you know that. Because in verse 4, it says, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said, and Judas, the traitor there, was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, and let me just stop right there and tell you something, because this is significant. In the original language, it doesn't say, I am he. The he's not there, only in the English versions. What Jesus really said, when they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, and he stepped forth, he said, I am, I am. And when he did, it says they drew back and fell to the ground. These are not wimpy guys. Some critics, and they're always critics of Scripture, have suggested that, well, you know, they were expecting a riot and a a fight or whatever, and it just caught them off guard when he just kind of stepped up and said, I am he. No, it did not. When he said, I am, I do believe with all my heart, that power went forth. Now, why would he do that? Because he was giving himself up but that's why he would do that. So everybody would be clear on the fact that he was not taken away, that he voluntarily went away. He was greater, he was more powerful than all those soldiers and temple guards put together. That was the purpose of that. And it also explains why when asked a second time, who are you looking for? And he says, they say Jesus, he says, I am he, that they didn't fall down because he didn't need to make the point anymore. And in fact, his focus was then focused on his men because he says, if you're looking for me, leave my guys alone, basically. So these three scriptures give us some real key information on how important I am is. So when Jesus says, I am, in the study that we're doing, it's not just a way of identifying himself as the person, it's a way of identifying himself as God. And my hope is that by the time we finish this, and I'm going to really work hard, girls, on giving you more stuff and less information, bear with me. But I'm hoping that by the time we finish this, that for the rest of your lives, when you hear the words, I am, as they relate to Jesus Christ, that you're going to understand those words in a way that maybe you never did before. And I hope that you have friends that you can share that with too, because so many people don't understand the significance of that. But you do, right? You got it. All right. If you'll bow with me real quick, I'm just going to close this in prayer, and you're allowed to run out the door, because I know we ran over, and we apologize for that. Lord Jesus, thank you for the time we've had together this morning. Thank you for the things that you've taught us. Um, In the midst of so much information, Lord, there's still so much truth to be found. Father, thank you for showing us that nothing is too hard for you. Thank you for showing us that no matter how annoying we may feel like we are to you, that you always have compassion for us, that you are mindful that we are but flesh. And thank you most of all, Lord Jesus, for giving your life as the bread of life so that we might have eternal life. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, girls, see you next week.